four hour block on wellness. We're not going to be here for four hours. So I have a lot of information to give you. Um, hopefully it will be things, you might have seen some of them before. Hopefully you'll, in fact, I know you're going to learn something new that maybe you have not learned before, even if you've heard me speak or present before. Aside from like the national conference, um, has anybody else seen me present about anything on wellness? Show of hands. Okay, a couple of you. All right, so none, nobody else has been to the FOP Wellness Summit. No? Okay, we're going to talk about that over there. Who has been? You have been. Awesome. Um, and I apologize if I don't recognize your faces right off the bat. Some of you in the room I know. Most of you I do not. Um, you don't know me. I'm going to tell you about me. Um, for the most part, I look pretty put together. But at the moment, I'm a hot mess as we stay down south. Um, I'm from South Carolina originally. You're going to hear me talk about that in a minute. Um, but with the head cold and all these things going on and forgot my clicker, you know, biggest presentation rule ever, don't forget your clicker, but we all need a little help from our friends and they got me a clicker, so I'm in business. Um, all right, a um, little bit about me. I am retired from law enforcement. Um, I worked in three different agencies during my career. Most of that was in South Carolina. Um, I don't sound like I'm from South Carolina most of the time because I'm a military brat. I grew up all over the place. I claim South Carolina as home because that's where I lived the most years of my life, um, more than anywhere else. So I married a cop, um, shocker, uh, from Connecticut, and that had me move into Connecticut because he had three sons from his first marriage. My three stepsons are wonderful men. Um, and so I moved to Connecticut in 2015 so that I could be with him. He's still on the job. He just got off work. Um, 30, I think 34 years he's in. So hopefully in five years or so I can talk him into retiring and we can move back to South Carolina. Uh, but for now I live in Connecticut. Um, when, I, when I left South Carolina, I went up to Connecticut, went from lieutenant back to patrol officer, which was an <laughs> awesome. Um, any, any lieutenants in here? Lieutenant Hood was okay, <laughs> but I wanted to be a cop and I wasn't a cop as a lieutenant. I was an administrator, um, which mm, I didn't care for, but anyway. Um, I'm not one of those kids that set out to be a cop in my life. Um, I wanted to be a judge, and then I wanted to be lots of other things. Um, but I was going through college. I was a good student, and I said, you know what? I'm sick of going to school, and I'm sick of not having any money. Uh, and I don't feel like going to graduate school, and you can't do anything with a bachelor's degree in psychology. So I think I'll go get a job. And I was an intern at Chapel Hill Police Department where I went to school. So I went down and became a police officer. And then, lo and behold, I liked it because my attention span is like that short. And you go from call to call to call and solve problems and move on to the next one. And I like that about the work. And I like that I had money and I like that I had free time because I didn't have any of those things when I was a college student. So I stuck with that for a while. And then somewhere along the way, I scratched my head and I went, shit, I didn't really mean to do this with my life. I probably ought to go back to school um, and get my master's degree in counseling. So I did that while I was a police sergeant. I went back to school, got a master's degree in counseling, worked as a clinician at the VA hospital in Charleston where I lived um, and got some clinical experience. And then life entered and I moved to Connecticut to um, be with my, who's now my husband. So um, that's kind of how I landed in this position. And I'll, we, we were talking earlier amongst the candidates about uh, your history with the FOP, so I'll get into that as well because that's a huge part of why I'm in this position as well. Um, first of all, as an aside, congratulations to you and your years of service. Um, your, your new president is going to have big shoes to fill in that role. Brent has been a major advocate for wellness, for which I'm grateful because that's my life now. Um, and um, congratulations to the State Lodge for having grown in the way it has. It's tremendous. Um, and so I will also share with you, although I took it off this slide because the last presentation I gave was in front of a bunch of psychologists. Um, I'm also the state second vice president of Connecticut State Lodge, so I'm also still an active FOP member. Um, I served on the state board for eight years in South Carolina when I lived there. So I'm also very involved in the FOP. I got appointed to the National Office of Wellness Committee when I was still a working cop because um, President Canterbury, past President Canterbury, who who's, I was his campaign manager for a few national campaigns, he knew 
degree in education and believe it or not, didn't want to put me on the committee because he thought it would look like favoritism. Um, but eventually put me on the committee. And so um, while I was serving on that committee, we, um, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. While I was serving on that committee, I had the opportunity to do some projects on that committee that kind of uh, put me into roles um, that I'll elaborate more later on in this presentation that then that's how I ended up as the director. Um, and I'm, I'm proud, proud and thrilled and I love my job and all that. So um, I will tell you one thing, my goal today is to get you all comfortable with talking about mental health. I know that, you know, for years now, this has been like one of the hot topics in law enforcement and we talk about, yeah, we talk, oh, we're talking about mental health again. Oh, but is anybody really comfortable talking about mental health? Are you comfortable talking about your own mental health? I mean, would you even now, with all the conversation, feel comfortable going to a colleague and going, you know what, I I'm, I'm not right. M many of us are not. I mean, I will share with you that I was at the International Association of Chiefs of Police Conference a few weeks ago. They have a new subsection for officer safety and wellness, and I was in a room full of police leaders who were interested in officer safety and wellness. And I said, hmm, statistics say that at least somebody in this room has been suicidal in the last year. Is anybody willing to admit that? Even amongst a group of people that are always talking about wellness. I know I probably wouldn't. So the goal is to get people comfortable with talking about mental health so that we remove the inability to talk about it when something's not right. I mean, you know, I don't want to stand up, you know, I would like to stand up here and be the best version of myself in front of all of you when I give this presentation, but I'm happy to share with you that I'm not because I have a head cold, but I'm going to give you the best I have in spite of that um, today. So that's my, my primary goal is to get everybody comfortable with talking about it. Um, the way that uh, we're going to talk about this today is I'm going to share a lot of information with you first. And then we're going to have a little audience participation. Um, I'm going to start with a little, oh, sorry, Travis, I just bumped your microphone. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of audience participation right now. By show of hands, who's retired in the room, retired from the job? OK, how many are retired, retired, as in not working at another law enforcement job? OK, awesome. What do you do now? I'm an accountant, actually. You're an accountant. Awesome. What do you do, sir? Nothing. Just retired. Congratulations to you. And, and you? I uh, referee high school football in Little League. Awesome. Referee high school football in Little League. Did I miss somebody? Anybody else retired? Yes? What do you do? Uh, mental health counseling now. First responders. Awesome. Mental health counseling. Perfect. That's what I like. That's what I do in retirement. Haha. <laughs> I'm not retired either. Um, okay. Who is um, command level? So lieutenant and above in the room. Okay. Handful of you. Who's patrol officer? on patrol and detectives. I have any of you in the room. Okay, so I got a nice mix. Any spouses or um, family members in here? Okay, great. Some spouses and, and a clinician in the back um, and another clinician potentially. Okay, great. So we got a nice mix of folks in here. What I want to start with is talking about what's right here. So we're going to talk about what you have locally and then I'm going to talk, talk to you about what we provide nationally and then we're going to talk about some how-to, some how-tos. You know, when I asked Brent um, is there anything in particular that you want me to address during our wellness training? He said, well, I just think we don't always have a good handle on how to do peer support. We have peer support, but I don't know that we always have a good handle on how to do it. So we're going to talk about how to do some of that. We're going to talk about um, how to do some of the other things that our national committee does, how you can do it kind of on your own. Um, but first of all, let's start here. Um, President Jex mentioned earlier that you guys have the state FOP wellness program, mental health program. Th this is tremendous. You guys are lucky because you're the only state lodge that has anything like this that I'm aware of. Um, the fact that your FOP will pay for visits for you or your family to see a clinician does not exist in any other state lodge that I'm aware of. This is a model. So um, I asked the question yesterday, and, and I think Brent stepped out of the room. Um, I didn't ask Brent. I asked someone else if they knew if there's been much participation in this program. 
And I think the answer was not as much as was hoped. Um, and I'm like, well, you know, maybe give it time. But there are officers across the country who are struggling to find the financial resources to pay for treatment. I can't tell you how many emails I get. Do you know of anybody that can provide money for an officer to go to treatment because they can't always afford to pay? Um, I'm going to talk to you in a minute about, how, about vetting uh, wellness providers. Um, and one of the things that we ask them when we vet them on our committee is what they do in a, is it, if an officer can't pay for treatment, how they handle that. Um, and, and I'll let you ponder what the right answer might be. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about, um, let me back up for a second. So you have this in, in your state lodge. Um, I know that you have culturally competent clinicians in your state, several of them. Um, which is also a blessing. There are some states we're struggling to find culturally, what we call culturally competent clinicians, meaning they're competent at working with our culture, with our law enforcement, first responder, what have you, culture. Um, you know, more specifically, um, there are some clinicians who are even more specialized than that, that are comp culturally competent at working with sex crimes detectives or SWAT team members or, you know, even more specialized than that. And most of those who are that specialized have, have previously been law enforcement themselves, and that's why they're that specialized. Um, so, um, but another thing you have yesterday, I spent, I got in yesterday fairly early, and I went to Chateau Recovery. Anybody in the room not familiar with Chateau Recovery? Okay, Chateau Recovery is in Midway. It is an inpatient, uh, inpatient's the wrong word to use. It's a residential treatment program um, that specializes in working with first responders and veterans. And um, when we vet residential treatment programs, which I'm going to talk about later in this presentation, we only accept those into our process that work with veterans and first responders. Um, if, if they don't have some sort of specialty, in working with veterans and first responders, we don't, they don't pass our vetting. It's that simple. Um, why is that? Because we know that cops trust cops. We have a hard time connecting with people sometimes outside the profession for better or worse. And there are arguments that, you know, it shouldn't be that way, that people are all still people. I get that. But it's hard enough for a first responder to acknowledge that they need to go to treatment. When we get there, we want them to be comfortable so that they don't leave. Um, so I had the opportunity yesterday to go out to Chateau. Chateau has been on our list of vetted and approved providers for four or five years now, but this is the first opportunity I had to physically come out to Utah and actually go to Chateau and tour the place. Um, some of my previous committee members did that part of the vetting um, before me, but every other facility that we have vetted, I have physically been to and toured and, and the whole thing that I'm going to tell you about. Um, Chateau Recovery is doing a tremendous job uh, with their clients. Um, it, it doesn't feel like, like you, you conjure up this picture in your mind, I'm going to residential treatment. Mm. That means rehab. And you conjure up this picture in your mind of what rehab looks like. Chateau <laughs> looks nothing like that. It looks exactly like you'd expect the Chateau to look. It's sitting on the side of a mountain in a residential neighborhood and it looks like a big, it used to be a bed and breakfast. And so one of the things that we do when we tour these facilities is we go and look at where the clients stay. You're in an apartment, basically, with another person um, who's another first responder. I walked into the bathroom and I was like, man, this is nicer than my bathroom in my house. Um, big tub, you know, beautiful place. Um, and so they spent three hours yesterday walking me through what the clients do and the work that they do to get well while they're there. And a lot of it is about the client doing the work and building solutions for themselves. And to me, that's key, because um, what I'm going to tell you about today is our wellness and our mental health is all our own responsibility. Um, we're responsible for ourselves, we're responsible for each other, and we're responsible for everybody else in the profession. Now that may seem like a heavy load, but not really. I mean, we're responsible for each other's safety every day, are we not? So, you know, we spend all this time dancing around mental health, but it's the same as your physical health. 
It's the same as your safety. They're all one and the same. And why somehow we have gotten stigma attached to what's between our ears, it is what it is. But every day it's our mission to try to change that. Okay. This is what I call our wheel of wellness. Um, Brent mentioned the things that we've built on the national level for FOP wellness. I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of these. Um, these are all programs that we've built since 2019, or one of them is still in, in the process of being built. Um, I am the only full-time employee of the Division of Wellness Services. I work full-time for the FOP now. Um, I have a committee of eight volunteers who are active and retired police officers who help me do a lot of this work that we do. But I don't have staff as much as I wish I had staff. We have no staff. So let's start here. Um, we're going to talk. I'm going to tell you what Power and Peers is. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. And then later um, in the class, we're going to look at a couple actual uh, things from the class. Um, and when I talked about how we're going to do some how to's. Um, so what happened is the background, let me see if I put any of the background in here. I did. So the background of Power and Peers is, and I mentioned that when I was on the committee as a member and I was still a working cop, I had the opportunity to do some things. In 2019, um, I was at a committee meeting and they said, the committee chair said, hey, uh, NBC New York News wants to do a survey with the FOP about mental health. And all of the wellness geeks, as I call us, on the committee were like, ooh, great, we can talk about mental health. And um, they had done, these three journalists had done a survey with the F International Association of Firefighters. Um, they, they, they wanted to do a story about how first responder professions impact on uh, mental health of the people who do the job. Um, and they wanted to tell the human side of it. They had such a great response from the firemen. They said, we need to go to the police and do the same thing with the police. And so I said, wow, great idea. Well, we started to talk to our leadership, and they were like, wait, the media wants to do a story with us about what? And we had several of our members worried about journalism taking the story about police mental health and flipping it to a negative and saying that we have a bunch of sick cops out on the road. And we were like, oh, I went, oh, that's a valid concern. Because as an active FOP member and leader, I'm all about protecting the rights and reputations of my members. So being that I live in Connecticut, I am two hours from New York City. So I went to New York City, and I met with the three journalists, and I sat down with them, and I said, listen, um, here's the concern. We need to make sure you aren't doing this. And furthermore, we want to design the survey because we have some things we want to know. And they were all like, OK. They were actually very good. They had very well-intentioned, did a very nice story. Um, it's, it's online. I found it yesterday. It's actually still out there. That talked about you know, the rate of police suicide and how you know, things are stressful in law enforcement. And it's actually very, very well done. Um, but we wanted to, like I knew from being a cop for 20 some years, knowing the, the mentality, um, knowing what services were available across the country from EAP to peer support to whatever, you, you know, whatever we had at the time, people weren't going to them. I knew that. Um, and people weren't using them, or people didn't have them available. Or if they had them available, they didn't know. And so I said, all right, I want to find out what's going on. I'm only one cop. I want to take the pulse of what's going on in the country to figure out how the FOP can fill in the gaps and build some stuff where it's either not being used or it's lacking. So one thing that we learned is that I knew this already. Critical incident stress is widespread, right? We talk about this all the time. We talk about PTSD in law enforcement. Um, OK, so then I said, OK, almost everybody has had some stressful experience as a cop, right? Here's what's happening to people when they experience stress, OK? Right? Again, not a secret. None of this is a secret to anybody who's been on the job any length of time. We've all been told this, especially now that we see more wellness classes, more resilience classes popping up. This, mind you, this was 2019. This was all more than five years ago. People weren't really talking about this every five minutes back then. So, so now it's not just me, right? Now I got it in data. This is happening across the country. Nearly 8,000 police officers responded to that survey. And 8,000, when you have 350,000 members, 8,000 doesn't sound like a lot. But I will tell you, 8,000 responses to a survey is a lot. 
in the world of academia where they think these things are serious. So they said, all right, well, they scratched their head and said, this is kind of a big deal, 8,000 people. Law enforcement officers actually sat down to take a survey and wanted to talk about their mental health. Hmm. Our, and that's when our leadership in the national FOP said, this is really important, our members. It needs to be more than just a committee, one of the 40 national committees that we have. It needs to be more than a committee. It needs to be something that we're building our work on. And so that's how the, how the, uh, the Division of Wellness Services got created. But we wanted to take more of that information and figure out how to apply it, right? The, the second message of this presentation today, aside from get comfortable to, with talking about mental health, is put the knowledge you have into practice. If, you, if you've got knowledge up here, but you don't take it out there and apply it, it doesn't, it doesn't you no know, good. It's useless knowledge that you pull up on trivia at night, right? So we wanted to take what we were learning from these surveys and put it into practice. So. What we knew, and again, I knew this, but I'm one cop only. I want to see what everybody else is doing. Most everybody knew they had an EAP, because everybody had EAPs back then. You know, you go to HR, you get your packet when you get hired. Here's our EAP. If you ever need help with your finances, you, you know, your family, blah, 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 here's your EAP. But I knew nobody was using them. Why was nobody using them? Somebody tell me why. Cultural competence. That's one reason. They didn't, it was another thing I heard over here. People didn't trust them, right? Thought, oh, they're gonna go back and tell my employer. I'm gonna be on the rubber gun squad. Um, yeah. Anybody not hear him? EAP clinicians were not specialized in working with trauma, for the most part. Okay, so nobody's using them, right? I knew that. So then I said, all right, well, we got critical incident stress management and debriefings. Every time we have a critical incident, you know, you get an email, all those involved from management, got to go to the stress debriefing. Okay, this is another way we're dealing with the critical stress on the job. Okay, a few less people had been to that, but okay, that, some of those are dead. Half of them said, look, yeah, that was helpful. Okay, even though they might not have admitted that out loud, this is an anonymous survey. So they feel comfortable doing that. But here was the thing. And I took my slide out, I think. Yeah, I took the slide out that talks about peers. The next slide that I left out, see, I'm not on my game, um, but we don't have to be every day, right? The next slide says peer support. Because even though in 2018, 19, not that many agencies had peer support yet, like 90% of the people who had had peer support said it was helpful. And we were like, hmm, that's it. That's where it is, right? So we said, all right, what do we do? Now, our initial thought was we have our DART team. Everybody's heard of the DART team. We have disaster area response team. When a hurricane, tornado happens, whatever, we send the DART team, great. And our first thought was, well, we can put together teams of peer supporters to deploy with the DART team when they deploy. Okay, great. How do we know these people have been properly trained? Well, you start looking around, and everybody's trained differently. We got five-day peer support, two-day peer support, three-hour peer support classes, and they're all different. And I was like, oh boy, we need a standard of training. So I said, all right, we need, to, we need to make a standardized peer support training program that the FOP can build to train the people that we're gonna put on these response teams. So I was at some meeting or something talking about our survey results, and somebody from the Department of Justice came up to me and said, hey, we got these grants you should probably apply for that can help you build some of those things you're talking about doing. Um, and so uh, anybody in here's agency got one of these LIMWA grants? No LIMWA grantees in here. Now they started giving these grants to agencies, um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But what they do, um, so our initial grant funded um, the creation of this peer support training that I'm going to tell you about, but the COPS office is providing LIMWA grants now to agencies to set up and develop and build their wellness programs. So um, I encourage you to look into this grant program. It comes up annually. I think applications for it open in the spring. They just uh, awarded all this year's grants. 
Uh, they award them in the fall. Um, and they have been funding our Power and Peers curriculum now for three years, and it will be funded for two more at least. And we just got an additional grant that I'm going to tell you about to do more work. But so another thing that we learned is <clears throat> we have always applied peer support historically in law enforcement after a critical incident, right? We have a big incident. We have an officer-involved shooting. That's when we apply peer support. That's been the history. But I've been in critical incidents before. Um, been witness to many traumatic scenes. Those were not the most stressful times in my career. The most stressful time, and I she's shaking her head no. Anybody want to throw out most stressful time in your career? Go ahead. Uh, uh, actually, it was when my first husband killed himself. When your first husband killed himself. And he pointed a gun at himself, and I thought he was dead. That was one of my stressful times. And the other one was my son passed. When your son passed. Those were my two. I'm sorry on, on both of those. I'm very sorry. Um, anybody else? Stressful times in your law enforcement career. For me, promotion, discipline. Not at the same time, <laughs> obviously. But those were the two most stressful times in my career. Now, I've been shooting. I've seen people's brains blown out, suicides, bad car wrecks, all that. Been shot at. That had nothing on those two things. Now, it's a different kind of stress, right? But I knew that there were other things. And... I've had as many co-workers take their own lives in the line of duty as killed in the line of duty, the number's five of each. And when I looked at what was going on in their lives when they took their life, it wasn't a critical incident. <laughs> it was something else. Money, substance problem, personal relationship problem. So I'm like, there are other things peer support could be doing besides showing up after somebody's been involved in a shooting. Most of us are prepared to deal with traumatic scenes. We're, you know, we're trained for that, right? We, we kind of expect that going into a law enforcement job. We don't expect to deal with your buddy who's been like your best friend, right-hand man for the last 10 years, stabbing you in the back during a promotion process because he wants the same job you want. Those are not the things we're set up to, to anticipate. You know, we're not expecting to get called to the carpet uh, when we thought we were doing the right thing to improve a situation out on the street. And, and that kind of stuff is what's stressful. So I was trying to prove a point with this poll we did that we needed to create peer support training that wasn't just responding to critical incidents. We needed to create peer support training that was, one, proactive, so that we're engaging people before they get to that point, and two, was responding not just when a critical incident happens, but when some of these other things are going on in people's lives and teaching how to recognize them. So we created the Power and Peers course. Um, I'm going to share some things with you about the Power and Peers course. Um, this is a brand new curriculum. Is anybody in here ICISF trained, CISM trained? OK, OK, a couple of you. Um, CISM training is critical incident stress management training. Those debriefings um, that I mentioned, the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation has been teaching people how to do critical incident stress management for over 20 years. Um, theirs is a standardized program. This is not that. This is, <laughs> I get that question all the time. People who are ICISF trained um, are often very proud of that fact, and they should be, because um, they've been doing a great service for a long time. It's sturdy training, but this is not it. This is very different. Um, what I equate it to is if you're ICISF trained, that's one tool in your tool belt. Power and Pierce training is a different tool in your tool belt, just like if you had a taser and pepper spray. It's two different things. Um, this is more uh, for day-to-day -day use. It's more for being proactive. It's more for common stressors that are common in law enforcement. We pulled in some experts to help us design the curriculum. It didn't all come out of Sherry Martin's brain. Um, Jeremy Conwell Bernstein is our, our guy that works with us in the cop's office. Um, on this curriculum. He's a, he's a former police officer himself. He's now a policy analyst that works at the DOJ. Dr. Coughlin there is a retired NYPD detective um, who's now in private practice as a psychologist. Um, he's an expert in police psychology peer support. He worked with NYPD's PAPA team. If you've ever heard of PAPA, they're peer support uh, for NYPD. And they're external, meaning that PAPA doesn't operate within the NYPD. They operate external. Um, so that cops don't have to use department resources. Um, Dr. Selfati is an expert in positive psychology, which is infused throughout this curriculum. 
you're going to hear me talk about positive psychology, and I expect my clinicians will probably know, but does anybody else in the room know what positive psychology is? Nobody? Good. I'm going to be able to teach you something. Um, and finally, Chris Scallon is a, a retired sergeant from Norfolk who has gone around the country setting up peer support teams and training. Uh, he's an ICISF instructor, quite a personality if you've ever met Chris. Um, he's, he's, uh, he helped us also because he knew what was out there already for peer support teams across the country. We wanted to take the best pieces of existing peer support trainings and then add things that were new and updated um, to make it more relevant to today. And so some of the things that are new about this training that are not in other peer support trainings, like some of the things are in every peer support training. Things like active listening skills. Any crisis negotiators in here? All right, I was like, crisis negotiators, you learn active listening skills. That's how you negotiate with people. Um, that, you know, assessing for suicide, those things are in every peer support class. But we added things like um, caring for yourself is the peer supporter. Um, how you make sure you're taking care of yourself. Because it's the whole oxygen mask thing. You can't help other people until you put on your own oxygen mask. Things like um, family wellness, we have some of that built into this. And the positive psychology piece runs throughout the entire curriculum. What positive psychology is, simply, is historically, the discipline of psychology has looked at what's wrong with people and tried to put a label on it and diagnose it by putting a label on it. Positive psychology looks at people's strengths and helps them use their strengths to get through trauma, to come out stronger on the other side of it, to help themselves by recognizing and building on their own personal strengths. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because these are the learning objectives. Um, I'm trying not to bore you to tears talking about the class. I just want you to know that it's out there and it's coming your way. Um, because this is going to become national standard, uh, because it's funded by the Department of Justice, which means we're going to be able to deliver it free for a while. This training is going to be free for a while uh, until we get a number of people trained in it. Um, and it's going to provide a certification as a supporting peer mentor to anyone who gets the training. Um, so you need to know that it's out there. We go through, there's a lot of practical exercise in this class, uh, meaning that there's a lot of role play. There's a lot of learning these skills and practicing the skills so that you're not having someone like me stand up and lecture to you for five days about how to support your peers. You're actually doing it in the class. Um, and I'm not going to fully engage you in practical exercises today, but we're going to practice a little bit in here today. Um, because Brent said, He's not sure, we're really sure that we're doing this right. So um, we talk about what good characteristics, characteristics of a good supporting peer mentor are. Um, some, everybody's not meant to be a good peer support. Um, you know, people that, um, the ideal supporting peer mentor is someone who's been on the job a little while, who is trusted by their peer officers, uh, who's respected by their peer officers, who maybe has been through some things themselves and, and handled it well and come out on the other side. And by handling it well, I don't mean that they weren't human and weren't a mess when they're going through something. It just means that they came through it and they're okay now and they're still on the job and, and they found a way to, to get through it using their own strength. Um, we talk about what positive psychology is. We go through all the parts of the theories of positive psychology, because that's kind of what drives the whole course and, and um, is the explanation for why we do all of the interventions that we do. We talk about identifying people who may need peer support. It's easy to go, oh, he, she was just involved in a shooting. They need peer support. But what about so-and-so who's showing up to work late, a mess, maybe smells like booze, you know, those people probably need peer support too, um, but we're not reaching out to them so much. So we talk about that, and I'll get on a soapbox for a minute. Um, <clears throat> when I was at my last agency in Connecticut, we had a guy like that, and he, you know, he showed up a mess, red-faced, um, sometimes smelled like booze, and nobody, you know, everybody would stand around and talk about him behind his back instead of somebody saying, "Dude, what's up with you?" 
You know, what, what are you doing? Why are you, you know, we can smell. Why are you coming to work like that? You know, but here's the thing, and this is what gets me. Because we don't have a level of comfort with mental health, we'd see that guy come to work, and then if that guy, you know, got killed in a crash because he was driving drunk or took his own life, we'd all be sad about that. Because, oh my God, we lost one of our own. But why in the hell didn't somebody intervene when they could, right? So um, that's where we're trying to go. You know, part of the things that we talk about in this class is how to intervene with those folks in a way that it may not always be comfortable, but it needs to be done. And it can be done um, and come out on the other side of that. So when you see a slide with these colors on it, this is from the actual Power and Peers class. So um, what we're teaching our supporting peer mentors is how to get their peers away from negativity and helplessness. Um, anybody in here know a complainer at work? Yeah. We, I think that, like, we had this conversation yesterday at Chateau. Chateau has this whole um, mindset thing that they do with clients at Chateau that's fantastic. And it's based on inward thinking versus, I'm going to get on, on a tangent for a minute. It's based on inward thinking versus outward thinking. And what that means is, if you look at the world and go, um, my job sucks because they did this to me, or you know, so-and-so did that to me and that's why I'm angry, versus I did this and this is the effect I'm having on people, or this is this way because of something I did. It really affects our well-being when we think we're a victim of everything. You know, um, I know people in my family, God love them, I love my family dearly, but there's someone in my family who everything is just a complaint about, and I just go, oh my God, what a way to go through life. It's much easier for us to think positively. Now, if someone's in the midst of a personal or professional trauma, it's not easy to think positively. They need to sometimes experience some of that grief, whatever it is, but why sit in that? Why sit in negativity and helplessness? I can't do anything to change my agency. It's always going to be this way, and it sucks. Why would you sit in that? Like, move forward. Keep moving forward, and that's kind of what this class is about. We focus on, um, when we talk about trauma, here's another soapbox I'll get on for a minute. If, if y'all can't tell that I'm passionate about this subject, um, in the profession, we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, post-traumatic stress injury. The language has evolved over the years, right? PTSD, PTSD. We talked about PTSD so much to the point that it's gotten to be common vernacular that we say that we had to sit in traffic and now we have PTSD. I mean, I heard my niece say it the other day. She's 14. I have PTSD because blah, 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 blah. Um, trust me, she's never been through anything traumatic. Um, Disorder indicates something's wrong, right? So language has evolved. Now we say post-traumatic stress injury because you can recover from an injury. You can recover from PTSD. If you are diagnosed with PTSD, it is recoverable. It's an injury. Think broken arm, broken leg. You get those injuries at work. You go out for a while. You heal up. You come back. Well, you can do the same with PTSI. Guess what? PTSD is very uncommon, even amongst first responders. Now, it's more common among first responders than it is among the general public, but the number of percentage of people that actually get PTSD, even in even law enforcement, is under 10%. Under 10%. So we're talking, it's great to be educated about PTSD and how to prevent it, how to, you know, what to do if you think you have it. But most of us come out with this instead, post-traumatic growth, meaning that we get through that trauma and we come out better for it. Either we have greater gratitude, we have, there's a whole list of things, I don't think I put it in there, no, I didn't put it in there, I didn't put that slide in there, but there's a whole list of things. Greater appreciation for life. People that realize post-traumatic growth come out with a much better outlook on life because they had gone through that trauma and made it through. So we talk about that. Um, we want to try to drive home the point that we're getting people out of thinking negatively about their well-being and about their health. 
You know, like, so <laughs> unfortunately, our professions have gotten this thing where we wear it like a badge of courage. Oh, well, I was a first responder, so I have gone through all these things, and I am broken. What is that? How does that, how does that help anybody to say that? You know, instead we should be saying, I was a first responder, I've gone through these things, I survived them. Yeah. And now I'm going to help somebody else do it. Right? We're all better when we're stronger. All right. So um, the active listening skills we teach, that's how we support peers the most, being an active listener. Um, for those of you who have never had formal instruction on active listening, it's not just sitting and listening intently, although that is a big part of it. There are actual skills that are involved in active listening and how you react to someone uh, when they're talking to you. We talk about how to assess for suicidality, really drilling down on getting to the point if we think somebody's going to take their life and having the courage to do that. We're going to talk about that in the practice part of this presentation. Um, how many of us go home, talk to our significant other, ask them how their day went, and then don't actually listen to the answer? I know I do it. <laughs> I mean, I'm trained in this shit. <laughs> My husband comes home from work, and I go, how was your day? OK. Anything interesting happened today? And I have to, I, I stop when I, usually when he gets home, I'm doing this, if I'm even home. Like, today, I'm not even home. I'm always on the road. But when I'm home, I'm usually doing this. And I have made a point to close the computer and stop and listen to his answer. And because I have done that, he now gives me an answer instead of going, eh, it's OK. I say, anything interesting happened? And he might go, well, not really. But then he'll see me looking at him, and he'll go, well, and then he'll start to tell me about his day. I say all that to say that a couple of things. It's not always easy to practice what we preach, right? Um, I'll tell you a story about practice and what you, what you preach. I tell people all the time, work-life balance, work-life balance, make sure you take care of yourself, self, make sure you take care of yourself, self-care, it's right there in the slide in the presentation. And I was with the guys from Chateau yesterday, and I said, yeah, you know, I haven't been sick since before COVID. I got COVID at the very beginning, before they were calling it COVID, and then I, I haven't been sick since. I haven't even had a cold since COVID, since 2019 or 20 or whatever. And I said, you know, if I'm being honest, the reason I'm sick now is because I haven't been exercising regularly. Now, I'm a, I'm a five, six day a week exerciser. Usually I run. <laughs> I try to run. Um, I haven't, I've, I've run maybe three times in the last month. And it's because I'm, I'm so worried about being behind in work. I have so much work I need to get caught up and undo. I got so many projects going on at once. And I'm like, ah, I'll just skip the workout and keep working. And for some of us, it's other things. You know, oh, I'll skip my workout. And, or whatever it is that's your thing. I'll skip my family time because I need to do this extra road job. And it, it kind of hit me like right then when I said it to him. I said, damn it, I'm not practicing what I'm preaching to people. I haven't been working out, and that's what keeps me from getting sick. I don't get sick because I sweat all that crap out when I work out, and I haven't been working out. And lo and behold, you know, I got a cold. So this morning, I got up, and I went outside, and I went for a run, walk, run, whatever. It wasn't, it wasn't comfortable when I started, but when I finished, I felt a lot better physically, mentally, and I said, now I'm back on track. And so... Stopping sometimes to realize that we need to practice what we preach is kind of key to our own personal growth, right? And you can't help other people grow if you're not growing yourself. So I think that, you know, my husband, because now I, he knows I'm waiting for an answer, he will tell me what's going on. And if I don't do that now, if I don't take that time, he's like, all right, well, great, good talk. And he gets mad. And so... Taking that moment to practice what you preach improves your relationships, improves your health, improves your own well-being. If you improve your own well-being, you can help other people. You see where I'm going with this. Um, and so actively listening to people, it's hard to do. It's challenging to do this. Um, even today, I was talking to the National Sergeant at Arms, Steve James, who walks in the room right on cue. And we were talking about something. And sometimes you, you're talking to people and your mind trails off and you're thinking about what you're going to say in response, 
instead of listening to what they're saying. And I caught myself and I stopped and I listened to him. And he was talking about his vacation and what a great time he had. And it made me very happy to hear about all that. And I wasn't thinking anymore about what I was going to say next. In fact, I forgot what I was going to ask him in the middle of that. I had, to, I had to come back to it. And so, you know, taking time, one thing you can do for yourself today is take five minutes to listen to somebody when they're tell, telling you a story. And even if it's, you know, if it's your spouse, if it's one of the other folks in the room here, um, listen to what they're telling you and just like take it in instead of thinking about what you're going to say. I promise you it'll improve your well-being. Okay, so um, talking about suicide alley, here's another slide from the Power and Peers class. When I talked about we wanted to take the best parts of existing peer support classes and then build uh, things that weren't there, we found that this was a great model for assessing for suicidality. It was already out there. Why recreate the wheel, right? So we use this model. We teach this in Power and Peers about how to assess for suicidality, how to react to it if we find that one of our folks is suicidal. We do talk about critical incidents because back to that slide that said, how can peers help with the survey? People still say they would use peer support most after a critical incident. Um, I think that's because we are accustomed to that. We are accustomed to using peer support after a critical incident because that's what we've always done. But the more that we get people accustomed to accessing peer support when they're struggling with other things, hopefully the more they will continue, they will start to do that as well. Um, so, but we do, we do need to touch on those critical incidents in the class, but we talk about non-critical incidents too, right? We talk about, in some of the role plays in this class, they're one of the scenarios is one of the things I already mentioned to you. Somebody has a substance problem, they're coming to work with that. One of the other scenarios I think is somebody has a, a child that's ill um, at home that they're dealing with, like a, like a terminal illness. You know, because those things all happen. We're still people. So all those things, so we still have fights with our spouse. I know some of the, some of the worst days at work I've had were when I was fighting with my boyfriend back in, I mean, seriously, like just unable to focus on work. And we, we all have had that. We're all people. And so, you know, here's, a, here's another soapbox real quick. I should start jumping up here every time I have one. You might think that you can't approach somebody at work and be like, hey, what's going on with you when you see that they're off? Has anybody, I mean, there is nobody in here who's never had a relationship problem. I can almost assure that. It's part of the human experience. If you are in this room and you have never had a, per, a problem in a personal relationship, I'm not sure you're human. We all have that. We all have times where we struggle to, to, to be better at something we want to be better at. I want to I want to drink less. I want to work out more. I want to go back to school. I want to be a better parent. I, you know, we all have things like that. And so why we can't have a, a common conversation with someone that we work with about it when we see something's bothering them, there's no reason. We all have the same human experiences. We all have been physically ill at some point in our life, right? These are all things that happen to people. And somehow when we put that uniform on, even we forget where, you know, we, we bitch that the public forgets we're people, but we, we treat our own people like they're not people sometimes. And so getting back to that. Um, so we talk about how to support people in critical incidents when they have been involved in um, a great presentation. Um, what, what was his name? CJ? D JC, thank you. I was uh, dyslexic. Um, great presentation from him this morning about taking people away from things when they're involved in a critical incident. That's one of the things we teach in Power and Peers is to, if you can, remove that person physically from the situation because there's so many things going on during a critical incident that that just, you know, sometimes makes it worse. Um, another big thing we talk about in this class because it's very, very, very important is confidentiality and peer support and knowing what they should and should not be telling you. He made some very good points about talking to peer support after a critical incident and body cams and things like we tell our supporting peer mentors to avoid talking about the incident itself until those things are legally played out in court or wherever they're going to play out. Because, because in some states, I was looking up Utah's laws earlier, you guys have protected speech among peer support in Utah. Every state doesn't have that protection. And so in some states, the peer supporter can be compelled 
to come and testify in front of IA or court or whoever about that critical incident if they have knowledge of it. So given that this is going to be a national training, we train people not to talk about the details of the incident. Instead, to be there to support the well-being of the officer who's involved in the critical incident. All right, I mentioned to you <clears throat> the sources of stress in law enforcement and critical incidents only being one of them. Organizational stressors are things like staff shortages, bureaucratic red tape, all the things you see in purple, favoritism, right? Things I mentioned like promotional processes and disciplinary processes. And then operational stressors are things like fatigue, you know, excessive paperwork, forced overtime, things like that. We did a survey in 2021 of police officers across the country and we, we gave them 60 critical, I'm sorry, we gave them 60 causes of stress for law enforcement. 20 were critical incident related, 20 were organizational related, and 20 were operational related, and we said, rate these on a scale of one to 10 as far as how much stress they cause you. Number one source of stress, staff shortages. Over and above having a colleague killed in the line of duty. So cops are telling us, world, it's not the job in the, in the PTSD that's so, so stressful for law enforcement. <laughs> Guess what, the organization's got a part in it too. But it's hard for administrators to hear that because that means they have to look inward and say, oh, maybe we're causing our cops some stress. We know that our job is going to involve critical incidents and traumatic scenes. We know that. It's a fact of life. It's never going to go away. That's going to happen to first responders. We do not always bargain on those organizational, you know, when I came on the job that I know that I was going to run call to call for a few years and not have backup, no. And that's stressful. It's stressful when you're on a scene and you're stuck there and you were supposed to be at your kid's birthday party three hours ago. That sucks and it's stressful and it's not anticipated. So this is why um, we have those other things in the power and peers class. Now here's a fun thing I like to tell people. You look at this list of 12 top rated stressors among those 60. It is feasible that one officer could be facing all of those top five at the same time. It's also feasible that one officer could re be responding to almost 12 of those all at the same time. Those are the folks that we need to be paying attention to, right? Those are the folks we need to be reaching in instead of waiting for them to reach out. Because if they're dealing with all that, you think they got time to reach out? We need to be reaching in to take care of our own people. All right, talking about self-care. I was just talking about you and you missed it. <laughs> it was. I was saying it was great that you were talking about removing peers from a scene uh, when they're in a critical incident. That's key. Um, lots, lots of things going on on those scenes and to get them removed. That's helpful. Um, Self-care. Okay. Can't put your other people's oxygen mask on if you don't have your own on. Um, when we were designing this course, uh, Chris Gallen there, who I said is quite the personality, he teaches peer support all over the country, has set up peer support programs all over the place. And I said, Chris, you know, what are you not seeing that you think needs to be in these curriculums? And he said, mm, we don't teach peer supporters how to take care of themselves. We need to do that. And I'm, mm, good idea. So we put in there, there's a whole uh, module in the course where we make, I say make, make's a bad word to use, where we ask the supporting peer mentors to put together a self-care plan It's on paper so that they can go back and look at, look at it and use it um, and refer to it in the future. And then teach other people how to build one as well. Um, and then we tie it all together, do some evaluations. Um, there's a practical and a written evaluation in the course. Oh, this is another cool thing. Um, one way that this class is unique as well is um, there's a train the trainer class and there's a regular peer support class where if you're brand new, like the train the trainer people have to have had two years of peer support already. If you're brand new and you're just learning how to be a supporting peer mentor, you take the regular class. On the fifth day, the agency that's hosting or the lodge that's hosting can opt to have one of these three modules um, taught. If it's the train the trainer class, it's a teach back where the, tr where the student is teaching their classmates. But for the regular class, they can teach, um, they can have one of these three modules taught, which is cool because we get to address 
some things that you know, maybe aren't always addressed. Um, the plan is for, um, in the future, we are going to develop additional modules for people who have been through the class that they'll be able to do virtually online as like refreshers and adding more skills. So our first pilot of this class is coming up very soon in December. Um, I will share with you that it took three years to write this course um, because of all the research and work that went into it. Um, so we're, we're very excited that we're piloting it in Chicago. It's going to be taught again in Colorado in January, and then the Atlanta pilot is going to follow probably in February. Uh, and then after that, we'll make a few tweaks or whatever we need to change or update or make better. And then we're going to be teaching it all over the country. So how this will happen is uh, we will go next with it based on demand. So if you want the Power and Peers training to come here to Utah, uh, email me. Encourage your neighboring agencies to email me because the Department of Justice is going to direct us to teach it wherever there's the most demand for it. In the train the trainer classes, there are no more than two people per agency in the class for obvious reasons. We want to train as many trainers as we can in different agencies so that they can go back and train their agency in the course. So um, especially if you're interested in peer support, you know, get in one of these train the trainer classes and so that you can go back and become the trainer for power and peers because this is going to be the national standard. Um, I'm excited that it has the FOP name on it. I think that um, the Department of Justice awarded us this grant because of who we are, um, because we're an organization that they know cops trust already. And if they want cops to buy in to peer support, um, who better to come from than us, right? Um, and I'm fortunate that I had those experts working on it with me. So here's another cool thing. Um, <laughs> I can repeat that. Um, so one of the other things we ran into is it, it, everything that we built is, is built on some practical experience or something that's happened to one of us um, on the committee. So I mentioned that I worked at an agency in Connecticut last. We have peer support in our agency in Connecticut. It's a 90, 90 person agency. Um, I had a feeling like I do about many things. And I said, hmm, I'm going to go ask some of my coworkers that they would feel comfortable using peer support if they were having an issue. So I did a little informal poll. And I said, oh, coworkers, A, B, C, and D, and E, would you use peer support if you need help? What do you think they said? No. Absolutely not. No way in hell. And you know, we can get into the reasons why. I've heard that answer all over the country. And the reasons are still the worry about the stigma, still the worry that there'll be fodder for conversation at choir practice. I hope everybody knows what choir practice is. Um, that there'll be the gossip of the department, that their confidentiality won't be respected, that it'll get back to their agency, all the same things. And I said, all right, well, we got to find a way to get around this because we can go train supporting peer mentors all over the United States, but if, they're, if their people, if their coworkers won't come to them, once they're trained, how the heck do we fix that problem, right? We can build all the services we want, but if they're not going to be used, they're not doing any good. So I said, all right, we need a way for peers, for officers to connect with trained peers who are not in their agency. All right, when we train people in power and peers, we can start to build a national network, a national directory of trained peer supporters so that they can call, when an officer needs help, they can call a peer in another state, another town, another city, another lodge, another agency, and we can make a directory where they can do that. Now, I mentioned that some things are still being built. This is still being built. Um, obviously, we haven't put anybody in it because we haven't trained anybody yet in Power and Peers. Um, but the other thing is that I'm trying to find a resource that will allow us to build an app um, where we can have our supporting peer mentors enter their profile in this app and then cops can sign up and just connect with someone through an app. The problem is and always will be money 
So I'm looking for a funding source to help us fund that. In the, in the meantime, until we can get that and build that, um, we're going to be compiling a directory of trained supporting peer mentors as we teach the Power and Peers class around the country. Every person who goes through the Power and Peers class um, will be kept in this directory. Um, you know, we will ask them to uh, volunteer themselves to be in it. Um, and, you know, as we come up with parameters for that, maybe it looks like a Facebook group where we have everybody in it that's, you know, been trained to network with each other until we can build it. We're open to ideas, so if you have any, we're never too good to take a good idea. So, um, but we're trying to solve problems, right? Here's another problem. This is 2018. This is a, st a statistic from 2018. I hope that we have lowered this number by all the things that we've been doing in the past five years. I hope that 90% of cops don't think there's still a stigma against asking for help. Um, because that's a big barrier, right? So I, I do this with such passion and, and commit myself to it because we're, there's no way for us to stop police suicide until we get past this. We, we have to be able to tackle this. So we asked about where does the stigma come from? Um, you know, and it's, you know, a lot of this is, again, not news to us, right? I'm one cop out of, you know, however many millions are out there. We knew this was the top risks, being seems weak or unfit for duty, but here's something we focused on. And it was touched on over here, cultural competence. We have cops that have gone to see a therapist, have gotten up the courage to go see a therapist, they walk in the door, and the clinician goes, you gotta leave your gun in the car. Can't bring that in here. What do you think the cop's gonna do? All right, see you, have a good day. Never come back again, right? We don't want that to happen. Um, we know if an officer finally gets up the gumption to go, is that an, that's an old person word, ain't it, gumption? Um, if they get up the courage to go see a clinician and they have a bad experience, chances are they're never gonna try again, right? And, and I like to tell people, think of it as a medical doctor. Like, you know, you go get a new general practitioner, you may not like the first one you go to. You may not like the first realtor you try to deal with or the first car salesman you try to deal with. Try again, right? Because there's a different fit for everybody. Maybe your personalities just don't click and it's not that, that you know, that therapy's bad. It's just that it's that clinician, you know? So try again. Anyway, how do we deal with that? Well, this answers a couple, a couple of things with this next project that we've built. The approved provider bulletin is a national directory of wellness services. So. Let's say I am uh, Sally, who's been trained in Power and Peers, and we've built the Call on Peers network. It's out there, let's say, five, ten years from now, and I get a call from Joe in California, and he's like, I'm on the phone with him, and I'm like, oh, crap, this guy's bad. Like, he needs to be handed up to high-level services. He needs to see a clinician. This is imminent. But I don't know what kind of clinicians are in the area where Joe lives in California. Right? Well, how the heck am I going to refer him to someone? We need to create a way for our supporting peer mentors to connect with a clinician, not just for themselves, but for somebody else that they might be helping. Right? And they need to have the confidence to know and be able to impart to that person that they're helping that the clinician that they're sending them to or the service they're sending them to knows cops, works with cops, understands, understands cops. Right? So <clears throat> when I got on the committee, way back when, they had already started to kind of informally do this vetting of resources that were out there because what happened was, what had happened was, um, we had really started to talk about rates of police suicide around 2017 and how they were higher than line of duty death and oh my God, we gotta do something about this. And so um, it, it, it kind of became trendy and potentially lucrative to start first responder programs and first responder tracks at some of these treatment, there, some of these high dollar, high end treatment uh, conglomerates were building wellness programs for first responders. So our FOP people were like, ah, we need to take a look at these and make sure they're really good, like they're not, like they're doing it right uh, before we send anybody. So they started to vet them um, informally. Chateau was one of the first ones that got vetted, um, was found to be 
culturally competent. Um, and so then, but what happened is after that survey and we found that, that space of that fear of lack of cultural competence, we said we need to be vetting more than just resi residential treatment programs. We need to find individual therapists that are culturally competent. We need to find a now, okay, well now wellness is a cool topic in law enforcement. Everybody's talking about it. People can make money, so now all these wellness training programs start popping up. Oh, well, we need to look at them too, because sorry, not sorry, but our fundraiser has no business teaching about mental health, right? We have a fundraising company that some FOP lodges use who put on a wellness summit. I'm like, what business do they have talking about mental health? They're neither law enforcement nor mental health people. Anyway, that's a soapbox. But we need to vet them, because who wants to listen to a college professor stand in front of them and talk about police mental health. Nobody. You know, in our world, if you haven't been there and done that, you don't, I'm not gonna listen to you. Um, I hate to say that, but <laughs> it's true. I mean, we know each other, we know we do that. So now, we vet, our committee vets residential treatment programs, individual therapists, wellness training programs for law enforcement, and wellness products like phone apps and things like that that are out there. Anybody out here have a phone app in their department? Wellness app, Lighthouse, Cortico, any of those? Yeah, what do you have? Mind base, mind, okay. Okay, yeah, and I'm not f real familiar with that one. But um, there are three companies I know of, because we vetted them, that have developed apps that have all these wellness resources on them, specific to law enforcement. Um, that's not one of them I know. But, um, so we vet those, we vet hotlines. There's crisis hotlines out there specifically for law enforcement. Um, we vet those one at a time, and we've compiled them in a directory that's on the FOP website we're building that directory every day. We're adding new resources to it every day. The, uh, and I'll show you a screenshot of what it looks like in a minute, but the, um, when we vet these resources, I think this is probably the key thing for you to know and something that we're going to teach you about how to do yourself today. Um, we look at a number of things when we vet them. Number one, are they culturally competent? Do they, have they been working with law enforcement? Do they know how to work with law? Do they understand our culture? Um, Another big thing we look at, how do they work with the client to pay? Because if I'm in a jackpot at work and I'm getting fired or got fired and I need mental health treatment, how the hell am I gonna pay for it when I don't have a job? But we don't want people kicked to the curb because they can't pay, right? So that we ask them about that. We ask them um, about what kind of therapy they do. And you know, fortunately I have knowledge as a clinician to know about trauma therapy and things like that and how they should be um, how they should be trained. So this is what the approved provider bulletin website looks like. It's, this is an outdated slide. So the site went live at the beginning of 2019. I believe that there are now something 60 or 70 providers in it and there's another 20 or 30 we have that have to be added. But the only person I think in the FOP aside from President Yost who's busier than me is our IT guy Andrew and Andrew's got to add them all. So it, it, sometimes it takes a few weeks. But we have interviews every week with clinicians to vet them, to put them in this directory. So like I'm looking right now, that dot in Utah is, is, is um, Chateau. But I know from looking at the Utah State Lodge FOP website that there are a number of vetted clinicians in Utah that work with law enforcement. And so we want to get them on this map too because we want everybody in Utah to know that they exist and they're out there. So when we, when we vet a clinician, they, they do an application, it costs them nothing, um, and we spend an hour or so interviewing them um, virtually. Me and another member of the committee interview them so that what we want is we want FOP members to be able to trust and know that when they go to this site, it's been vetted by other cops who feel comfortable, use, who would feel comfortable using that service. So um, when we started to do the vetting, <clears throat> oh, having said that, if you know clinicians or services or wellness training or something that you've been to or seen that are good, please tell them about this and, and, and or refer them to us so that we can get them included in this directory. Our goal 
is to identify as many culturally competent wellness providers for law enforcement as we possibly can. And that's going to be an ongoing process for, for eternity that we're going to continue to try to find these providers and add them to this directory because one size doesn't fit all. Your clinician may not work for someone else. It might not be a good fit. And so we want people to have options. Um, and the more dots on that map, guess what? The more we're talking about mental health. Hmm. When we started to do this betting in earnest, um, some of those grantees I talked about, those agencies who got those grants, were starting to build their wellness programs. And they said, um, we know you guys are doing betting. We need to find a clinician to work with our department. How do we do that? How do we vet a clinician for our department? So we wrote a guide. Um, this is our guide about how to vet wellness providers. It's online. Um, but we're going to talk about that in a minute because um, I'm going to teach you how to do some things to vet some providers. The FOP Wellness Summit, uh, there were a couple people who said they'd been to it. That is our two-day wellness training event we held annually in Nashville. Um, it's coming up in February. Um, what we do at that event, if you have the opportunity to go, is it's two days full of seminars about all sorts of wellness things. It's about family wellness, spiritual wellness, financial wellness, um, setting up peer support teams, canine therapy dogs. Um, we, we bring in experts in all these different topics to talk about all these different things. We have keynote presentations from some of the people um, who are biggest in the officer wellness field. Um, we have what we call a department showcase where we bring in agencies that have good wellness programs to talk about how they set up their wellness program um, and what they've done to add to it and build to it. Um, we have optional physical fitness included in this as well. We have a group walk every morning, a run, it's self-paced. Um, there's yoga available. There's opportunities to learn about things like that that you've never learned about before, mindfulness. Um, and it's a really fun two days. Uh, if you get an opportunity to go. The other thing that we do in conjunction with that, and this is something that no other police organization does, is we have a day before the wellness summit where we bring in those wellness professionals, those therapists um, and clinicians, and they have a day of training themselves where um, I call on some of those experts like Dr. Coughlin, who's retired from NYPD, and they get training from those other psychologists about what's going on in police mental health. We tell them about all the things that we're doing so they can get familiar with the FOP. And then they can also go to that wellness summit and attend the same sessions and connect with the officers that are attending and their family members to build those relationships with officers, officers that are there. This will be the fifth wellness summit that uh, we, we have had. And last year's attendance was double that of the first one we had. So um, it grows every year. It's a fun time. Um, all of these things that I've told you about that we've built were built based on that first survey we did in 2018. And I say all that to say that it's all because of the membership of the FOP. It's not because of the leadership of the FOP. It's not just because of Sherry Martin and her critical incident committee or whatever it's called by whomever. It's all the members of the FOP that took that survey and told us what we needed to be doing. And so we went, hmm, that got us very far. We've built four wellness initiatives that we didn't have five years ago based on survey feedback from, from members of law enforcement. We're building things for law enforcement. We need to keep doing this. So in 2021, we started a practice of surveying um, members of law enforcement every two years. <laughs> and it makes me laugh. The 2018 survey, um, we did not anticipate what it was going to do for us as far as building these programs. We didn't anticipate how much it was going to stir up conversations in law enforcement about mental health and wellness. And so we didn't, you know, go through this big process of, of really using academic rigor to construct the survey like they talk about in college. Um, we just did a survey. And it was tremendous. And I was talking to someone uh, who was an academic, and she said, you know your survey's crap, right? And I'm like, 8,000 people responded to the survey, and I've been talking about it at conferences for eight months. But in the world of academia, they thought it was crap because it didn't do all these parameters that academia wants. Well, guess what? Hold my beer, because we got an academic partner who helps us design the survey now, 
and it does meet academic rigor, so they can't make that argument with us anymore. This is, this is trust, trusted research. Um, so our collaborator uh, is from a university in Australia, and I was asked by an American academic why an academic in Australia. Well, the answer to that's twofold. Number one, um, Dr. Drew, or Jackie as I finally refer to her because now we're good friends, uh, has been working with law enforcement for more than 20 years. She's an academic um, working with Queensland Police Service in Australia. Reason number two is academia is mostly uh, not on the side of law enforcement in this country. So um, we didn't want to pull in academia that wasn't necessarily on our side. So um, she worked with us to develop the 2021 survey, and I'm going to just show you some of the things that we gather from that and, and what we're doing with that data. This is some of the things we looked at, right? We wanted to know about the demands of the job. We wanted to know about how cops were feeling about their mental health, but we wanted to know, most importantly, what resources are being used. And are we on the right track with peer support? Are we on the right track with culturally competent providers? And what's still missing? What do we still need to be doing? So um, we looked at you know, causes of stress. We looked at the overall impact of those causes of stress. And then use of support services. What's being provided? What's being used out there? I'm waiting for him to take a picture before I change slides. All right, so that's what the survey looked like. We did it online. All right. These, are, these are slides are put in here to show you that it was a nationwide survey that got nationwide response. We aren't just talking about what was going on with law enforcement in the Southeast or in the Midwest. We're talking about nationwide. We're talking about all sizes of agencies, right? We're talking about from the smallest agency to the largest agency. We're talking about active and retired because active participate, I'm sorry, retired participated in the survey too. Um, we're talking about um, agencies that are in big cities and small cities, we're talking about people in all ethnic groups, we're talking about male and female. Um, all those things were represented in the survey, pretty much mirroring what the population of law enforcement officers looks like in this country, right? Because we want to track over time whether what we're doing is working, we're going to continue to measure levels of suicidality, levels of psychological distress, things like that. We're going to measure those every two years. But we also change the survey every two years to reflect what's going on with law enforcement in the country. So in 2021, we were coming on the back of the pandemic and dealing with the aftermath of George Floyd's death and all of the negative sentiment that was hitting us in the face, right? He touched on it earlier. And so we wanted to know how that stuff was affecting law enforcement mental health. And so we asked about critical incidents is what we called it. And they fell into three different categories, three, three, these three different categories. But the number one critical incident, or sorry, critical issue facing law enforcement in 2021 for them, felt by them, was remo removal of qualified immunity. Now, did you guys, you guys didn't lose qualified immunity in this state. But they did in Colorado. We did in Connecticut. I think there was one other state that lost it. Police accountability, right? Causing huge problems in law enforcement, violent crime being next, right? This was a huge one. And I mentioned Sergeant at Arms, Steve James. He um, is the chairman of the Legal Defense Plan Committee. And when we were making the survey, I said to him, is there something, you know, I asked the other committee chairs of our 40 national committees, is there, you know, is there, this is not just a mental health survey, it's an FOP survey, is there something you want us to ask the members? And he said, well, we're seeing an uptick in officers making legal plan claims. And so when an officer thinks they might be sued, arrested, or fired, they can initiate a legal plan claim, whether it's happened yet or not. And so he said, we're seeing an uptick. Can you ask about this? Huh. Huge numbers of cops thinking they're going to be arrested, fired, or sued just for doing their job, right? So this is the climate we're facing. So that removal of qualified immunity was big. I put those in there twice, apparently. What does that mean for staffing, right? Because I showed you that slide that said staffing shortages was the biggest stressor. We know now in 2023, recruitment is the hot topic, right? Recruitment and retention, we're losing cops, we're all short-staffed. And 
that last slide I showed you with the fear about being prosecuted for doing your job impacts on retention and recruitment. How do we recruit people to this job when they have to worry about losing their livelihood for doing their job? Or they think they do, right? What we learned is that the larger the agency, the less commitment to that agency. Now, what we have since learned, because Jack and I picked this data apart more, is that cops are more committed to the job than they are their agency. So what we're seeing a lot is that cops are leaving their agency and going to another agency where they feel more appreciated, more valued. And it makes complete sense to me that the cops that feel the least attachment to their agency are those in the larger agencies. Which, if you think about it, oh, but they provide a lot of wellness services and other things in those large agencies, but it's in those bigger cities that we're seeing a lot of the anti-police rhetoric. And that's why. Um, so it makes sense to me. All right, what does that have to do with wellness? Well, there's those numbers. 66% worried about being criminally prosecuted, 68% civilly sued, 53% worried about being fired from their job. Source of stress? Yeah. All right, so, yeah, oh, so I, I want to say, caveat, um, I'm not meaning to minimize critical incidents. Um, being involved in a critical incident is stressful. Um, so I don't mean to minimize that. I, I, it's certainly important that we continue to pay attention to those. However, we need to also make sure that we're paying attention to the other sources of stress for law enforcement. So those organizational and operational stressors, we wanted to look at which of those is actually causing cops bad outcomes, meaning problems with their mental health, right? What's actually causing them to be suicidal? Um, and I will tell you, you, hear, you heard it here. Uh, it's probably not the first time you've heard it. Suicide is never, ever, 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 ever about just one thing. Someone does not ever, ever, ever take their life because of one thing. Uh, I can say that with 100% certainty. It's always more than one thing. So, you know, if we sit around after someone takes their life and go, oh, well, I think it was that. Hmm. It's always more than one thing. So when we looked at the top five critical incident-related sources of stress for law enforcement, here are the top five. Having a colleague killed in the line of duty, killing someone in the line of duty, responding to a call where a child was badly beaten or abused, being shot at or threatened with a gun, and being seriously injured. When we looked at organizational stressors, here's your top five. Staff shortages, bureaucratic red tape, favoritism, inconsistent leadership style, and failure of the agency to have the back of the police officer, right? Not, not secrets, so I don't think to any of us. Here's your operational, top five operational stressors, fatigue, negative comments from the public, not enough time to spend with family and friends. I felt that a lot in my later years of my career when I was salaried and I'd be expected to be at work for 60 hours a week. Um, finding time to stay in good shape and occupation-related health issues. Me getting blown out, right? But again, we've already talked about this. Top cause of stress, oops, is not a critical incident-related one. It's an organizational-related one. Pardon me. Okay. So we've hammered that. What's burnout tied to? I will share with you that large numbers of police officers in this country are burned out. Um, when we looked at the numbers for what's considered, <coughs> excuse me, clinically for burnout, the numbers are very high. <coughs> because of the types of things we talked about, the organizational and the operational stressors. Here we go. <clears throat> Burnout <clears throat> is tied to psychological distress. <coughs> now, when we compare law enforcement to the general population, our diagnoses on <clears throat> anxiety, depression, and PTSD are all higher than the general population. But 
they're still relatively low. I mean, 12% PTSD, I mentioned that. Here's one thing I want to hammer home. We talk all the time about PTSD. We need to pay attention to trauma and the effects that trauma has on cops. More cops are diagnosed with depression and anxiety than they are PTSD. And here's a tidbit. Science has proven that physical movement improves mood. So when I talked about how I got out there this morning and went for that run, not only did it improve my physical health, because I started to clear some of this crap out, and improve my mental health. And I'm like, duh, I know this stuff. So keep that little piece of knowledge in your pocket. Um, I think oftentimes when an officer takes their life, it's not on the back of a trauma. We mentioned that already. It's something else, right? And a lot of the times depression is involved in that. Anxiety is involved in that. You know, they're, they're not showing up the way they should. That oftentimes is depression. So learning to recognize that. Um, I want to acknowledge you know, what we learned in the survey about suicidal ideation, suicidal planning, and suicidal attempts. Um, we didn't use percentages so much in these statistics as we did people, because if you think about it, that is 222 people who had attempted suicide at some point in their police career. 222 people at some point in their police career. 73 people who took the survey in 2021 <clears throat> had made a plan in the last 12 months to take their life, an actual plan. That means we still have work to do. Suicide attempts, 10 attempts on their life within the last year among the survey respondents. Now, when we have 6,000 people take a survey, 10 people seems like a small number, and percentage-wise it is, but it's still 10 people. We still have work to do. All right, here's something that I thought was a little bit alarming. Um, we know from research that the danger zone, as we call it in law enforcement, is somewhere between that 11th and 15th year because <clears throat> officers are too far in to leave the profession and can't quite go yet. So there becomes this feeling of being trapped, right? I can't leave, I can't, go, I can't stay, this is, you know, it's taking a toll on my well-being. I know I probably felt most burned out in that time frame on my law enforcement career. So we kind of anticipate that, those, those higher numbers, but less than five years of service? Why are those folks thinking about suicide? So that's something we need to maybe dig into a little bit um, and have those conversations with our newer folks. We asked about physical health in that 2021 survey. Uh, for the most part, cops feel like they're doing pretty good physically. But interestingly enough, many, 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 many police officers say that the job has had a negative impact on their physical health. Um, what we did learn is like some of the retired ones, that, that number goes down. So that's good news to me, you know, like maybe physical health seems to improve once you get off the job. But I know we can all probably relate to having an injury caused by being a police officer. I have one, um, you know, that I'll never, it'll, it, my knee will never be the same until it's replaced and then it's not the same knee anyway, it's a new knee. But, you know, um, so all of this information that we gather in these surveys gives us a lot of direction about what do we do to build other programs, to you know, fill in gaps that we're still missing. How do we prevent some of the stress that's being caused for law enforcement, law enforcement officers? We can't prevent the traumatic incidents. We cannot. But can we change organizational and operational policy to make things less stressful for our cops? Can we look at staffing and, and you know, where we place cops in our administrative structure? Can we look at shifts and how we work shifts and figure out ways to reduce stress? Can we find ways to give cops more time to spend with their families? And th that's where we can make some headway. So Jackie and I um, have done a lot of presentations at conferences that are police chiefs, and psychologists 
and policymakers about how to affect these changes. So I'm not always just talking to a room full of cops because a lot of you will go, shit, I can't do anything about that. I'm not the chief. But we have been talking about this to chiefs and policymakers to try to spread this word that, hey, if you want to take care of your people, you got to be looking internally at, at how you're running your organization to do that. Um, another thing, and I'll, I'll share this with you, we look a lot in the current survey, which is open, I'll talk to you about that in a minute, about organizational justice. And what that means is, it's a big fancy academic term for how your agency treats you, how you feel like you're being treated in your police agency. We ask about that a lot in the 2023 survey because what are we looking at as a critical incident in law enforcement? Retention and recruitment. And that all has to deal with how your agency is treating you. If you feel like you're being treated well, if you like your job, you're not likely to leave, right? So we ask about that a lot, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Another thing we looked at, wellness programs, because we want to make sure we're on the right track, right? We want to make sure our wellness programs are doing what they need to be doing, that people are going to use them, that we're telling people the right things when we come out and tell them, OK, yeah, you need peer support, you need a good uh, culturally competent clinician, you need chaplaincy, you need all these things if you're building a wellness program. So the, the length of the bar indicates what's available to the cop, okay? So they all have employee assistance program, that's very available. Informal and formal debriefs are very available. That's sitting around in the squad room, in the locker room, before or after your shift, talking to each other. Or a formal debrief where you have a critical incident and you have a debrief. Chaplaincy services are, you know, are more common. Substance abuse programs, common. Peer support's getting up there. It's becoming more common. But what are people actually using? They're using that informal or formal debrief, right? I did that every day at work, sitting in a squad room talking to my coworkers, right? That's your informal debrief. They're using online training for mental health. I found this interesting. I think the reason for this is twofold. One, COVID. Um, that drove people to do a lot of online training. Two, Cops want to help themselves. They don't want to have to ask someone else. So the more that we can empower each other to help ourselves, or the more we can find resources to point our peers to, the more they can get information about their mental health. Um, and again, the more information we have about mental health, the less stigma. The more we learn about the reasons why it should not be a taboo subject. Um, why you can go online and read about all these things I've been talking to you about. Because the more you know, the better you're going to be. All right? Um, followed by in-person training programs, mental health first aid training, and annual mental health check-ins. Now, um, effectiveness of the programs. Again, so the, the length of the bar is the number of times it was used. So how many people are using that? Again, we said informal debriefs are the most used, online training second most used. But what did they find most effective? Peer support, number one, right? This is good news for the FOP. We're building peer support. We're training people in peer support. Great. Number two, chaplaincy service. Number three, employee assistance programs. And now here's where I'm going to come back to talking about EAPs. Historically, we have said EAPs bad. EAPs bad. Don't use EAP. For the reasons that the gentleman said earlier, a lot of them were culturally competent. Often, EAPs go to the lowest bidder. They don't necessarily have culturally competent clinicians on staff because they're rare and harder to find. But we're hearing around the country that some people have really, really good EAPs at their agency. And so I would say to you, don't just dismiss your EAP. Take a look at them and see if they have culturally competent clinicians on staff. And if they don't, a lot of EAPs now will work with you as an FOP to find a culturally competent clinician to put on staff. Now, you guys have a head start already in the FOP state, um, state Lodge because you have that mental health program that they've set up for you. But if your agency is not thinking about employing a culturally competent clinician on the EAP that they've contracted with, they should be thinking about that. And you, as FOP leaders, can be the ones to point them in that direction. Um, because there are good EAPs out there who are aware that they need to have a culturally competent clinician on their staff. Um, okay, let's see. We asked about external programs, so things that aren't provided by the agency too, just to see what else people are using. Everybody goes to their general practitioner. That's why the bar is so long. Everybody's got to go get a physical every year, just about. Um, but what they told us is that what they're finding effective is other mental health providers outside. So people are going to therapy, 
that's not provided by their department, and they're finding it helpful. So if other cops are going to therapy and finding it helpful, guess what? It could work for you too. Um, I've been to therapy. It's great. And it's not, people have this image of laying on a couch, and <laughs> it's not like that. <laughs> so um, I promise you, it's not like that. Dr. Coughlin has a couch in his office, but nobody sits on it, it's for show. Um, okay, so what do we know about providing wellness services? We know that the more wellness services an agency provides, the lower the psychological distress of their people. And we can take a look at that because we ask, you know, every respondent to the survey about their levels of psychological distress and then about how many services they're provided by their agency. The more services an agency provides, the lower the psychological distress of their people and the lower the stigma about using the services that are provided. So I say all that to say, provide options for your people in your agency, in your lodge, and great job, Utah FOP, for providing those options, right? If you can provide them an online resource, if you can provide them um, an EAP, if you can provide them chaplaincy, provide them peer support, provide them all these things, because everybody's not gonna engage with the same thing the same way. Like, you might feel comfortable using peer support, but you want to look online for a resource. So the more things you can provide, the more ways we can get at the problem. This is an article, Dr. Oh, I'll leave that up there for a second. If somebody wants to take a picture. We wrote a, an academic article about this survey and, and what we found about use of services so that all the thinking minds in the police academic world would read it and tell um, agencies to build wellness programs because they work. Um, people are using them. And when they are using them, they are seeing positive outcomes, okay? Um, so the 2023 survey is open now. As I said, we measure some of the same things. So we ask about, you know, burnout. We ask about um, what services are being used. We ask about um, some of the same things we asked about in that data I just showed you. But this survey is heavy on how is your agency treating you? So this is, and it's an anonymous survey. Um, you don't have to identify your agency or anything about yourself. You can take it completely anonymously. Um, so because we want to try to get the same thing, there's a QR code for it if you don't have it already, if you haven't taken it already. I also have some little business cards that have the QR code. So please take the survey. It takes about 15 minutes to take it. Um, but the amount of data that it provides us to to go to conferences of academics and chiefs and talk about what law enforcement's experiencing from our voice. Because, you know, what I said about this at the national conference when we opened it is, I look at the news and I get frustrated because I see all these things being rained down on law enforcement and we don't have a way to speak back. And the FOP's done a good job of getting our message out for all of us, right? But as an individual, I can't get on social media and go on a rant when I want to about what law enforcement's facing. And, and many of you can't because your police officers in your agency won't let you. Um, but this is our chance to talk about what it's like to be doing the job and what we need and to talk about what's helping and what's not and you know, to, to speak up for ourselves. So I, I can't encourage it enough. Please take the survey. Retirees are eligible too. We ask about retiree health and if your agency is providing anything for retirees um, so that we can start to continue to, to encourage to build programs for retirees as well. Um, if I didn't mention this earlier, the Power and Peers course is open to retirees. So if it's held in your area and you're a retired member of law enforcement, you can get in the Power and Peers class and learn to be a supporting peer mentor. I am of the belief that retirees are one of our greatest resources. Um, they've been there, done that, have all the knowledge, and it also gets them and keeps them involved in our community, which, which helps them stay well as, as well. Um, we publish articles every month in the FOP Journal. If you get the FOP Journal in your email, there's a wellness article in there every month. These are old links to articles that were written a couple of years ago, um, but they're all still out there online. Uh, we pick a different topic every month, so you can take these, use them in your law, recycle them, take them, share them with people. Um, that's what they're there for. So that's our wellness program, and we, um, you know, we like, all right, well, what do we do next? Uh, President Eos is always like, all right, well, this is all great. What are we doing next? And I'm like, wow, we don't have enough to do already. 
Um, well, guess what? There's another one coming. Um, I mentioned that we just got another federal grant. We are going to build a family wellness program uh, that's going to add on to Power and Peers. So Blue Family Focus is going to be an extra day and a half that's added on to the Power and Peers class where we bring in family members of the officers that are in the Power and Peers class to learn about stress in law enforcement, to learn about how they can support other law enforcement families. Um, and then we have a kind of like a, a networking social thing on the half day after to bring all those groups together and really start to build those relationships. So look for that. It's coming down the pipe. Next couple of years we'll be working on building that onto Power and Peers and it'll go right into our wellness program. Um, we're going to take a break and then I'm going to teach you a few practical things when you come back. It'll probably be another half hour or so once you come back. So take a five minute break. Huh, eight minute break, huh? <laughs> How's it going? Huh? You're very engaging. Oh, thank you. So, some people you go and you listen to and you're like, uh, yeah. moving on. <laughs> I know. I try to be. It's, no. You know, I see if I see people not paying attention, I'm like, oh no. Yeah, I'm telling you. My I mean, panic button goes right. off when I see people not paying right. attention. Yeah. But I'm sure, well, I mean, cops are cops and they're just, yeah. I mean, you I know. know as well as anyone I know. else. But. I know. I can't pay attention <laughs> either, so I get it. Well, even the way down here, my husband's like, another wellness thing. Mm -hmm. I'm so sick of wellness. Uh -huh. I know. He's like, I feel like they're force feeding it that I think I have a problem, even though I don't have a problem. Right. But that's not what we talk about anymore. And I said, I think you're really going to like her. She's she's just dynamic and fun oh, and she's good. Friend, so. I hope he likes it. <laughs> he actually has, he's doing, an, he, he's supposed to be doing interviews right now uh -huh. for um, his job. And so he's like, I'm just going to sit back there and listen and listen to them and tune in. But oh. I just want to tell you. Oh, well, thank you. Job. I appreciate it. Is this your it. first time at Utah? No, um, I was here for the conference. Oh yeah, that yeah. was here. Okay. What, yeah, what was it? Twenty eleven. Okay. Yeah. I was like twenty thirteen. Yeah, that's right around. They all ran time. together I for know. me. Isn't I can't. That weird, though? Yes. You get to that point. To I cannot remember where any of them oh, were. No. Like I can't. I'm always having to ask Rob, my husband, like, right. where were we last? <laughs> I can't where remember. Are we going where we were, now? Yeah. Like I remember we were in Vegas, yeah. but like I can't. Like, where were we? I don't remember. Day before that. Yeah. And I only know that because Rob took such good care of me. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Now I remember that. Yeah, that but fun. yeah, yeah, yeah I, I could not remember. No, no, no. Yeah, because now, like, my first one was 2003. Oh, was it really? No, yeah, no, wait. Is that right? Rhode Island, yeah. Providence. Probably. Yeah. That's a long time ago. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, okay. it just makes me old. <laughs> hey. Hi, I'm our peer support team lead. Awesome. I'm wondering if I can get your business card. You can. Here, and I'll give you a survey card, too. Tell all your people to take the survey, please. Awesome. Oh, really? That is awesome. That is awesome. How big is your agency? We have 60 sworn. Where are you? Logan City. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know. Embedded clinicians and everything. Oh, for oh, that's awesome for an agency that small. That's fantastic. How many clinicians? in the valley that they want, family, so it could be spouse or kid or, or them, or retiree, and we have a grant that covers all of them. Oh, that's great. Are you, are you a lean, do you have a LIMA grant? No. Mm -hmm. No? Where'd your grant come from? Um, the state of Utah. No kidding. Five million dollars and you can apply, and they disperse. That is fantastic. And that's been guaranteed for the next two or three years. Oh my God, so. that's incredible. Yeah. We're really, really blessed here in Utah. That is great. So, 
Do you think that people go? Oh, I know they do. I know they do. so good. That is so good. I mean, yeah, just getting people to normalize it, you know? Like, you go to the freaking doctor when you get sick. Why, you know? If you're having problems at home, freaking go to a counselor. That's great. What's your name? I'm Roz Bublin. I'm sorry. Roz. Roz? Is it sure for Rosalind? Yeah. Yeah? All right. Uh, nice to meet you. Yeah, you as well. Thank you. Yeah. And then uh, I'm going to try and get to that chair. Yes. Yeah, please do. Yeah, I, you know, the, so the plan is that we plan to have a train the trainer in every state. It's just a matter of time, you know, how long it's going to take. So our grant funding right now is through the end of 2024. I'm going to apply for, to continue the grant until we have at least one train the trainer class in every state. Um, because otherwise, how are we supposed to scale it out, you know, unless we have classes in every state? So, yeah, just be on the lookout. Potentially. Yeah, potentially. What has happened to me, we haven't started filling the Colorado class yet, so email me, like, next week. Um, what happened to me with the, and I say happened to me, it's not like anything bad happened, but what happens is the Department of Justice has a lot of say in who goes in the class because they have all these grantees across the country and they're putting their grantees in there, which I, I get it, you know. Um, I think we, out of a class of 24, I think I got eight people in, and the rest were grantees. So that's going to happen. Yeah. But I'll certainly try. Okay. Yeah. If you reach out to me. Yeah, I'll put in for yeah, it. Yeah. Please do. Yeah. That'd be great. Then you can go train the people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Oh, really? Never heard of it. And they gave out, like, a whole bunch of cards, like, after, like, it. Really? Yeah. So it's, like, called Save UT. Okay. For frontline workers. Okay. And it says... Do you know what's on it? Um, I could show you that. Like, yeah, I'd like to see it. What kind of resources are on it? Just Here, I'll come like down. An anonymous app yep. That, like, you can chat with people or you can get support. And start a call. Oh, cool. Hmm. Neat. So it's like, I don't know. They just like that's you good. Can type back and forth. And huh. Good. And you can send chat. That's great. Password protected. That's pretty good. So they gave it to us, and I think it's ran by like the Department of Health and Human yep. Services. Yep. Yep. So gotcha. I thought it was really good. Awesome. The the ones that I, it is good, especially because it's free. Yeah. You know, the ones that I mentioned that are law enforcement specific, they sell to agencies. You know, like the agency gets a grant or whatever and buys the app for their people. So they cost money, but they have a lot of law enforcement specific stuff in there. Yeah, so they just like, they started like pushing it pretty hard. At yeah. The prison, so. That's good though. It's better than nothing. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like they got a whole bunch of like cool digital cards. Yeah. Too, good. Okay, I'll mention that when we get back in here. Thank you.
Y'all ready? Uh, it ain't working. Hello? I'm not going to use it. I was just trying to get people back in here. I'm not going to use it. I was just trying to get people back in here. It looks like it's on. I don't think it's working. It just ain't that loud. Hey, there you go. Y'all ready? Call the people in the hall back in here. Let's go. I need her back in here. Sit down. Shut up. I'm not going to tell you to shut up. Okay, I'm going to teach y'all how to do some stuff. If you guys want to take your seats. that thing called? called Safe UT. Safe UT. Okay. I just learned from one of the folks in here that there's an app in Utah called Safe UT that's free. It's a mental health app. It's not law enforcement specific, but it is free. Say again? What do you mean? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's a different one, you said? He's, okay, he says there's a different one. It's for frontline people. Safe UT. So there's something out there that your state's providing. I was um, explaining, though, that the, the apps that I mentioned that we have vetted cost money. Um, usually the agency gets a grant and buys them for their officer, but they have law enforcement specific information in them. I do know that Lighthouse Health and Wellness provides a free version of their app. So if you're not familiar with Lighthouse Health and Wellness, they provide a free version. They will upgrade the app and do specific things for your agency. Like you can put your whole peer team in the Lighthouse app when they customize it for you, but that costs money. All right, three things I want to impart some knowledge that you can use, apply in the real world, about peer support, vetting resources, and wellness visits. And then when I finish with this, we're going to be done. All right. So why peer support? I think we've kind of beat that to death. We know cops believe in peer support. They think it works. They use it. Well, they will use it if they trust it. Um, if you pick the right people for your, for your team, they're trained well, and people use it, and, the, and their secrets are kept, and confidentiality is in place, it can become a very good resource, OK? We still have suicide deaths in law enforcement, so we still need resources. All right, now. Brent said to me, I'm not sure that we're actually sure how to do peer support. So I'm going to, without giving you the five-day class, I'm going to teach you a few things to look for. I mentioned already the officer that worked in my agency in Connecticut who was showing up disheveled and late and smelling booze, red face, all these things. Unfortunately for him, that had been going on for years and kind of progressively worse and worse and worse and worse. He's retired now. Um, but when you see people who come to work and all of a sudden are kind of suddenly progressively things aren't right with them, they're quiet, you know, we all kind of pick up on these things, especially if we're close to someone at work. If we're not close to them, it might be a little harder to pick, on, pick up on. If somebody keeps to themselves, you know, and maybe they're not well, this is the hardest ones are the people at work, and we all know them, who are not well liked. Um, it's hard sometimes for fellow officers to 
engage those people if they're not well liked. I, I'm the sort of person who all of my life have engaged the underdog. And I, I don't know why I have that in me, but you know, like even in high school, I would always talk to the kid nobody talked to. Um, and so, but so I, I recognize that sometimes it's hard to do that, especially if, you know, if you're really busy at work or you're in a certain role, it may not be cool to talk to the, to the employee that's not liked or not popular. But I'm going to submit to you two things. One, we're all human. We already went over that. We all have the same human experiences. And two, we're all cops. We have a responsibility to look out for each other. If, if that cop you don't like is out on the road and is involved in a shootout, you're going to cover them. You're going to have their back. If that cop you don't like is struggling with something personal, you still have a responsibility to have their back. So somebody's got to step up and talk to them. So how do we do that, right? How do we have those conversations, especially if it's somebody that's not well liked? Well, it's really pretty simple. I mean, hey, how you doing? And, and, and the cop who's not well liked or maybe you know, you've never engaged with because you don't know him that well is going to be like, he or she's talking to me at first. They may be standoffish. If you have a concern that one of your coworkers, something is going on with them, it may take persistence. You may have to try it more than once. You may have to try it a different way. But it should eat the hell out of you if you think something's wrong with somebody you're working with and you don't do anything about it. Right? That's part of what this organization's all about. And I apologize for the um, thing in the, in, the, in the thing there. I didn't take the Adobe stock thing out of there. This is straight from Power and Pierce, by the way. You approach the person, ask them if you can talk to them for a minute. Like, they'll totally, totally will catch people off guard sometimes, especially if they don't know you very well. Hey, can I talk to you for a minute? You'd be like, what, me? Why? And then you say, well, and then you identify something specific, right, that you've noticed about them. Like, if you were the guy back in my old agency, I'd be like, hey, are you, I've noticed that, like, you look really red in the face. Are you feeling all right? You know, and so by identifying something specific that you have observed about their behavior, about their appearance, about their work performance, and that's the one that really sometimes will wake people up, is if you, if you identify something about their work performance, especially if they're a peer, like at the same rank level as you. And because they feel, should feel, also feel a responsibility to you as their fellow officer. You know, I've noticed that on that call the other day, you seemed like you were a little off. Is everything going okay with you? Like, are you, I mean, are you struggling with something? And sometimes those simple words, is everything okay with you? And they'll go, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. We all say that, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Are you struggling with something? No, I'm not struggling with anything. So again, it may take more than once. It may take asking that question in a different way. I see you guys picking each other. You're being funny. You're being like, hey, you struggling with something, buddy? <laughs> all right, we're all, we're all smart asses. I get it. But maybe it's a joke. Maybe you joke with them. But you got to make sure if you're going to joke about something like this, you know that person that they're going to take it as a joke, right? If it's someone you know well, these conversations are sometimes easier to have, sometimes not, right? But I encourage you to start simply. Hey, I noticed A, B, C, D. Appearance, behavior, demeanor, right? That's easy for all of us to do, to identify something tangible. What does identifying something tangible do? Doesn't make it seem arbitrary to where the person can't just think to themselves, oh, well, they're just picking on me, they just don't like me, they just, whatever, attribute something. If you identify something specific, then that will be a good, like, they'll understand there's a reason why, not just something that, you know, maybe they think you didn't like them. Consider the venue, where you do this is important, right? You don't want to sit in the middle of a crowded squad room at briefing and go, hey, buddy, I know she came to work red face. That's not how you do that. Right? Pull them to the side, get them to the, when they're by themselves, maybe, you know, 
loading up something in the cruiser. Do it quietly, privately, because nobody's going to admit to anything going on with them if you do it in front of a room full of people, right? We're also very conscious about our privacy. Allow them to talk about it. If, if you approach someone, everything okay with you? I noticed this about you, about your performance, and they say, no, I'm okay. And you persist and you say, no, are you sure? Because it seems like it's not like you. You're not normally this way. And then they go, no, I'm okay. Leave it alone. Try again and when they show another cue, right? Because if somebody's really struggling with something, there's going to be more than one cue. And then you can go back and say, mm, I know we talked about this the other day, but I'm really concerned about you because, you know, and let's say you're thinking to yourself, all right, I don't like this guy. I'm really not concerned about him. Maybe you're that, maybe you're that officer where you're not really concerned about your fellow officer. You can say, listen, I'm concerned that like things are going to be unsafe at work. Even that is something to say that will get people to be like, oh, and they'll start to recognize. Okay. Now, this is key. If you are trained peer support in this room, raise your hand. Excellent. Excellent. Many of you are already trained. You're not therapists, and you already all know that. You've already been told that in peer support training. You have to recognize your level of, of capabilities when it comes to supporting your peers. Okay? So sharing your experience, let's say you've been through something rough in your life. You shared your experience in here earlier. Sharing your experience and indicating that that's been part of your experience and maybe indicating how you got through that experience, sharing your, how you, you know, use your strengths to get through it, will encourage someone to speak about it. Sometimes that encouragement's needed. Once that person starts to open up to you and starts to talk about it, let them talk about it. Don't talk for them. Let them talk about it. And remember that if they get to a point that they are suicidal, they need help more than peer support. They need more assistance than peer support. You can't diagnose as a peer. You can't say, well, I think you have PTSD. Hmm. I think you might be depressed. Hmm. Even if you're using common vernacular, like I know we say that all the time, you know, I'm really depressed. Because if someone is actually suffering from depression or PTSD and you say that to them, they may really think something is wrong with them when in fact maybe they're not actually suffering from that, right? We're not clinicians. All right. If you, so going back to venue, considering where you engage the person, you gotta be prepared in that moment to give your full attention to them if they need it, right? So if we're on the way to a call, that's not the time to engage your peer and ask if everything's okay with them, okay? The time to do it is when you have time to listen if they do talk. Because if they know, like, you're being rushed to go to a call, they're not going to be willing to talk, all right? It may take um, engaging with the peer out of the work, outside the workplace, you know, finding a time that, that you can meet with them something to talk to them outside the workplace. The point is, is that to do something is better than to do nothing, right? Here's another thing that's a myth. Um, there's a myth out there that if you talk about suicide and you use the word suicide, it puts, somehow puts the idea of suicide in someone's head who's not suicidal. That's bull crap, okay? And so, in fact, when it comes to suicide, it is very important because this is a very serious subject. First responders often make, often make the, t the final decision to take their life that quickly. They'll be thinking about it for months, thinking about it for months, thinking about it for months, and then when they do it, it happens that fast. And so it's very critical that we're direct when we ask about this. When we have to ask our coworkers about this, it's critical that we're direct asking about, are you thinking of ending your life? So one thing that we learn in, cr in crisis intervention and, and psychology and all this is means, opportunity, and plan. 
right? Do they have a plan, a specific plan? Well, yeah, I think I'm going to go jump off a bridge. It's different from, yep, I'm going to go to the Cooper River Bridge at 5 p.m. today and jump over the edge. There's a big difference, right? So if they make the statement, yeah, I, I'm going to go jump off a bridge or something, they may not be very suicidal, right? We often make statements like, yeah, I'm just going to pray, I give up, you know, but we're not actually suicidal. It's suicidal, what we call uh, behaviors, but it's not actually suicidal. But when they have a distinct plan or, um, you know, they're giving things away that mean something to them or they're making threats about doing violence to someone else specifically, those are things that we can't handle as peers. They have to be referred to someone at a higher level. And the way you have that conversation with them is, is you use an old active listening skill and I statement. You say, listen, I'm really concerned that you're making statements that, make, that indicate to me that you're going to take your life. And I care about you. And I think we need to get some help with this. You ally, ally yourself with them. Walk through them with it. Be direct. Tell them, you know, that you're concerned about them. Whether they believe you or not is not important. The fact that you've indicated that you've heard them, that you care about their welfare, and you want to provide them help is what's key. And then you go forward with doing that. Um, any questions about that? Anybody want to ask a question? I mean, I don't think we talk often enough about how to, how to do this. It's easy, you know, like we do this with citizens out in the public, right? When we have a suicidal subject, we have these conversations with citizens out in the public. It's a little bit different when it's somebody you see every day at work and you know. But I can't say this any more simply than to say get over that and see them just as another person. See them as a person who's struggling with the same sort of things you might have struggled with at some point in your life draw back on your own experience of having struggled with something, pull that out and think about how you would have wanted to be treated in that moment and then treat them that way. All right, um, again, the REACT model says we need to limit restriction of means. Eesh, that's touchy, right? What does that mean? It means <laughs> we might have to get them away from their firearms if they are truly suicidal. So how do we do that? I say, the best way to do that is to be transparent, to be clear, and to be direct. You are thinking about taking your life. We probably need to get you away from things that are going to get you to the point of taking your life. You know, let me walk with you, and then get them to a place that you can get them to give. Most people who are, si who are suicidal, honestly, are exhausted, and they will give up their firearm. If they're willing to even acknowledge that they're suicidal, they're going to be helped and they will give up their firearm willingly. You won't have to pry it out of their hand. Figure out who they rely on, who their emergency contacts are, and get those people involved to help support them. Okay? Especially if it's someone you don't know well. You know, if you're the brave soul who confronts someone about their behavior and they admit to you that they're suicidal, but you're not close to them, you've got to find out who is because they're going to need some support that you may or may not be able to give them because you don't know them as well as those other people do. Give them access to other resources. If you know, give them, give them access to FOP Wellness. Give them access to any other resources you might know of that are out there. If you, know, if you find something online, whatever you know of that's another wellness resource, 988 Hotline, Cop Line. I hope everybody's heard of Cop Line. That's a, that's a suicide hotline for law enforcement, staffed by law enforcement, the people who take the calls are retired cops. They're excellent. Um, creating a safety plan. Creating a safety plan involves setting up steps that the person's going to take to ensure their safety. So, for example, um, what a safety plan might look like is in that initial moment when you get them to the point that they, if, if the person admits to you that they're thinking about taking their life, you set up a plan with them for what they're going to do next and next and next and next so that they don't go back to that point of thinking of taking their life. And what that probably is going to involve is getting their, their support system involved, getting them to a, a clinician, a hospital, something to keep them safe until they can get stabilized and they're not thinking of taking their life. 
And then finally, treatment referrals, which oftentimes will not be left up to someone who's not a trained peer supporter. But treatment referrals come you know, when we refer people up to those higher level services. All right, whatever the case, and this seems like I shouldn't have to say this, but whatever the case, if someone indicates they're suicidal, they should not under any circumstances be left alone, not even for a minute. And the reason for that's twofold. One, it's <laughs> they're suicidal. They could take their life. But two, once they've admitted that, the, the kind of the embarrassment, you know, the, the shame and all of that is going to come down on them, and they need to feel supported. And so sometimes just having someone next to you can feel like support. Also keep in mind, depending on your state law, and thank goodness Utah has protected speech, but I'm not sure if, if your law stipulates. I think it stipulates a trained peer support. Um, yeah, so it can't be, and he mentioned this earlier, I think, in his talk, it can't just be your buddy. Someone who's your buddy might be compelled to disclose, so keep that in mind, but support as best you can. You know, if, let's say, you have, um, let me say this, if you're not a peer supporter in this room, trained peer support, make friends with one. If for no other reason than if you find someone else that you know that needs peer support and they need to talk to someone who's who they can protect confidentiality with, you know, let's say you're not a peer support, but you've got your, your friend, Jill, who's a peer support, and then Bob admits to you, yeah, I, I'm th I've been thinking about killing myself, and this is what I'm going to do. And you go, okay, Bob, listen, I'm going to stay with you because you need support, but I, I'm concerned that your confidentiality is going to be compromised, so I don't want you to say too much to me, but we're going to go and talk to Jill because everything you say to Jill is protected. And so in that way, you're helping support them and also protecting their rights and their confidentiality and getting them the help they need. Does that make sense? everyone? Okay, any questions about that? How many people in this room feel like they could do this? Feel like you could do this if you needed to? You guys don't feel like you could do it? Well, raise your hand, dadgummit. Thank you. <laughs> I did, I did. <laughs> and I'll say it again and you'll like it. All right, um, non-critical incident themes that we see, and, and we talked about this earlier. Big, 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 big light bulb came on for me a couple years ago. We did a little survey during COVID. Um, it was a mini survey about COVID and how cops are dealing with COVID and what's stressful about COVID. And number one source of stress around COVID was fear of taking COVID home to their families. It was not fear about their own well-being, their own welfare. It was fear of taking COVID home to their families. And... Um, that brought to light that families are the number one concern of cops, their family, and their well-being of their family. Also, families are cops' biggest support systems most often. So it's their biggest source of stress and their biggest support system, which is why we have Blue Family Focus coming, for one. But keep that in mind. Um, you know, we're always told not to bring our personal stuff to work. Spare me. Who can go to work and not carry with them when something's going wrong at home? Nobody can do that. Um, you know, and, and, and I think more cops end up in rehab in the midst of divorce than anything else. So you know, keep that in mind that that's there. Somebody might be struggling with something at home. Um, their health, including financial health, and job-related operational and organizational, so things like the disciplinary process. How many times does a guy or girl get in a discipline issue and they're told they can't talk to anyone at the department or pe you know, people shun them and don't call them? Holy crap. That's when people need the most support. You know, so here's me, the girl who always talks to the underdog. I'd be the one calling that person. Hey, are you doing okay? You don't have to tell me anything about what's going on at work but I know you're going through some trouble at work. Are you doing okay? Is your family doing okay? Because that's a really stressful time, right? So reaching out to those people during that as well. Those are things we don't always think about. You know, we're accustomed to 
doing what we've always done, which is, oh, hell, they're out on discipline. We can't talk to them. They're still people. And oftentimes, they're still people we've worked with for years. So, you know, I, I encourage you and implore you, really. All right. Something, keep in mind that what's critical to someone may not be critical to you. I know two cops went through basically the same shooting incident, had to take the life of a juvenile wielding a shotgun. One was fine, one had ended his career. One, and it was all in their mindset. It was all in how they coped with it um, mental health-wise. And so I say all that to say that, you know, you may look at an incident and go, well, geez, that's not really anything. But to the next cop, it might be something because of their background, because of their belief system, because of anything. So don't pass judgment on your coworkers um, based on what they've been through. Also, things like divorce. You might go, well, pff, I've been through a divorce, no big deal. But really, I mean, divorce is hard. Um, and especially when it's got to do with things that aren't critical incident people aren't going to be likely to engage peer support. So you're going to have to reach in instead of them reaching out. Because we've been trained, peer support is for when you've been involved in a critical incident. But guess what? We just talked about divorce, getting in a, a discipline problem. Those things are stressful and might cause someone to get to the point that they're at the point of suicidality. But they're not going to ask for help during that because there's shame involved. Right? So get beyond that. Also, some of those things might happen all at once. Right? I know I was talking to someone yesterday who was nearing retirement, but wasn't quite there, realized that his marriage of 20 years, neither one of them had been happy for 15, and that they needed to divorce, and his drinking increased substantially. And his kids noticed. So all those things going on at once. How common is that? We've seen it. We've all known people that that's happened to, right? That's a, it's common. But, but that guy felt like he was the only one that had ever done that. And, and shame ensues. He ended up in rehab. Fine, su, fortunately, successfully came out of rehab. He's working through the divorce. He's still divorcing. But has, his relationship with his kids is fine. His job is fine. You know, so those things can be dealt with. But proper support, and, and, and the first step in that support is recognition from our coworkers. Acknowledgement that we are going through something and then normalizing it as human experience. And then a focus on getting them back. Getting them back to work, back to normal, back to a place of strength, even if the normal looks like a new situation, right? Keeping them alive. All right, so a few strategies for families. Um, I'm kind of getting myself geared up for building Blue Family Focus. Um, communication, I think, is the number one thing. And I think I touched on that when we talked about, you know, what I do with asking my husband questions when he comes home from work. If any of you, if any of you have ever heard Kevin Gilmartin speak about um, emotional survival for law enforcement, that's the number one thing he talks about is you know, you come home from work, you sit down in your recliner, you click on the TV, and you zone out. And you're, that's, your that's what your family gets. That's what your loved ones get, is they get the zoned out version of you. You gave your best at work and didn't bring it home. And that's how we get to a point of divorce. So, number one thing, communication. Talk, 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 talk about it. And we have this whole thing, oh, I want to shield my family from my job. Bull crap. You know, if they, if they married you or they're with you, they know you have a dangerous job. I'm not saying... You have to tell them every detail. What I'm saying is you communicate with them about what they want to know and what they don't want to know. And many of your family members can handle a lot more than you think. But it's a matter of having a conversation. Maybe they don't want to hear all about your calls. But have a conversation about what they want to know and don't want to know so that expectations are set. Right? If you get home from work and you need 15 minutes to decompress or 30 minutes or an hour or whatever it is before you can you know, be with your family, set that expectation. Let them know that I need, you know, X amount of time to chill. And maybe some days, maybe it's not every day, but maybe you have a secret word with your spouse or your partner where you say, today is one of those days where I need 
my half hour of chill time, and I'll be right back. And then you show up with your family, right? So working together, and it takes two. I mean, it takes a spouse who's understanding, a partner who's understanding as well. Um, don't forget to show your appreciation. Self-care, this is for everybody. And we also talked about this earlier, not just taking care of your physical self. Obviously, we've been talking about taking care of your psychological well-being, um, your emotional well-being. That means spending time with people you love and sharing love with people you love, even if it's your coworkers, your friends. I don't spend enough time with the other people I love, meaning my friends, um, mostly because of work. But I'm trying to do better. And spiritual well-being, which doesn't necessarily mean religion. It just means taking care of your spirit, you know, however you connect with that. Those, those are all important pieces. All right. This is going to go real quick. Um, I want to tell you guys about this topic. Do, you guys don't have mandated mental health visits for law enforcement in your state, do you? It's not state mandate. Some I don't, agencies do. Some agencies do. Okay. Um, I was looking at your laws earlier. And I didn't see a state mandate. Um, but this is a hot topic, so I want to give you some information. Because some states have mandated it. I talked about this in connecting with service providers who understand the job. And I'm going to shorten this by telling you that a mental health visit is meant to be an opportunity for a cop to connect with a clinician to get psychoeducation, which means get information about mental health, like I've, most of what I've imparted to you today is psychoeducation. Um, to make a connection with a clinician in peacetime so that if they have a problem in wartime, they, can, they already have that relationship built. And there's no stigma and there's no, you know, no, no delay in forming a bond with a clinician. They can get help. Unfortunately, some, day, some states have started to mandate these in a not so great way. And what I want to share with you today is what you should know about them and what they should be so that if your state starts to form a mandate, you as FOP leaders can get involved in that legislative process and make sure that they're designed the way they should be. Now, I feel confident that it will go well in Utah because Utah already has a lot of good mental health things in place in this state. And your FOP leadership in Utah is astute about wellness things when it comes to law enforcement. But, um, I'm going to spare you all this stuff from another presentation we did, but there are about six states now that have mandates. And some of them have good. This is language straight from the good mandates, right? Some states are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. They're mandating that the cop go see a clinician. Usually it's annually. It's just like you've got to go get a physical every year. You've got to go see a clinician every year. And they focus on officer well-being. The clinician gives the officer information. They don't do any tests, any assessments, any nothing to, that looks like a fitness for duty. It's all for the officer, all right? This is some bad language from some of the bad statutes. Words like screen, assessment, fitness, anything that indicates that the officer is being looked at um, in a negative light, right? That they're being tested, assessed, measured, Anything like that's not good. I can say this because I'm from Connecticut. This is Connecticut's law. And it's completely defeating the purpose of what wellness visits are supposed to be. Um, what happened in Connecticut, unfortunately, is that there were um, bills in place where agencies were going to be required to set up wellness programs for law enforcement, much like Utah has. Utah has a law that says, Police agency, you need to provide mental health resources for your agency. Connecticut, there were some bills that were aimed at doing that. None of them ever made it to law. George Floyd happened. Then we got a police accountability bill. They took away our, our, um, our um, qualified immunity. And it became this, where now cops have to go get an assessment every five years. Completely defeats the purpose. And so we are trying to nationally get the word out about how to craft these annual wellness visits. If they become a mandate for your agency, for your state, for FOP to get involved in the process to make sure that they are what they are supposed to be and that they're not an assessment, they don't resemble in any way a fitness for duty, that they are meant to provide a connection and information and support 
for the officer who's getting them. So that's the objective, right? Reduce the stigma, increase the knowledge, build that relationship. Um, these are things that should be talked about. And, and when I say talked about, not the officer asked about them, the clinician providing information about them to the officer, right? Um, there's lots of considerations about building a program. I won't get into all that. All right. If you are building a wellness program in your agency, in your lodge, um, I encourage a lot of local lodges to start build, to consider building a wellness program in your local lodge. I mean, the state, your state has a fantastic wellness pro mental health program, but there's nothing that will stop a local lodge from starting to provide local mental health resources to your people. Even if it's just information, sharing information with them. Um, sharing those articles with them that I showed you earlier, just talk about it, normalize talking about it. And I know someone said earlier, God, another mental health program. I'm so tired of hearing about mental health. And I get that. I mean, I know we've kind of beat that horse a lot over the last year, but the whole point is to normalize it. Because I hate to say this, even though, yes, we give a lot of presentations about mental health and we talk about it all the time, cops are still killing themselves. So there's still stigma. So until we talk about it like we talk about going to the doctor for a physical every year, we need to still be talking about it and providing access to services. All right, this is the members of my committee. Um, I don't like to do anything without acknowledging all of them. They are tremendous help uh, to us in all that we do. Um, and there is our email and my email and our office number. Um, if you need to email me, email me. Don't email Officer Wellness because we don't get to that email box as often as I do my own. Um, I have business cards up here if you would like one. I have um, cards with the survey code on them. If you've taken it, great. Take a survey card back to your agency or take a few and hand them out to people so that people will take the survey. It closes on November 15th and then we'll start aggregating all the data. data. Um, I think Utah so far has done a decent job of participation. Um, but we really want to hear from as many people as possible. Uh, any questions? Anybody got any questions about anything? Okay. If you think of one later, you don't want to ask me right now, just email me. All right? Thank you all very much for being attentive.